Good evening and welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. My name is Maya Tudor and we are just delighted here at the Blavatnik School to have one of India's most celebrated journalists, Barka Dutt, here with us for the next hour. And the panel, this is going to be very much a Q&A based discussion, so please do be thinking of your questions for Barco. This is intended to be a very much an interactive discussion. So to many of you, Barco will need no introduction, but let me briefly state a few of highlights from her long and storied career. Barca is the founder and editor of the digital platform Mojo Story. She's a columnist with the Washington Post and the Hindustan Times. She's an Emmy-nominated reporter. She is a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum several times over. And she's the winner of over 40 national and international awards. But beyond these accolades, Barca is also known as being someone who goes to the front line and tells the difficult stories, really capturing our imagination and bringing those frontline stories to our homes. And for that, she deserves all of our thanks. She's also the author of two books, Unquiet Land, Stories from India's Fault Lines, and as I understand it, To Hell and Back, Humans of COVID, which is releasing this month. And so we all look very much look forward to that. So I'm going to start by posing the question really um, of the panel, which is about Modi's continued electoral success. So perhaps more than any other, Modi personifies populism. He is the charismatic chaiwala, the tea seller, the everyday man who meditates, but is also Superman. And that is, of course, true for India, but, but what's so interesting is that while populists around many parts of the world have faltered, Trump has lost his re-election bid. Today, Johnson's popularity in the UK is at a historic low. So why is Modi's success so enduring? So tell us a little bit, what's the secret to his success? Thank you, uh, Maya, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out on a rainy uh, afternoon. It's good to see a full hall and to see faces in person. And I know many of you have tuned in online as well. So thank you for that. Um, I'm only going to be making some guesses here and also some impressions from being a kind of a cynical reporter now for over two decades and counting. When I was traveling uh, through India's heartland, where elections are presently being held in the most uh, politically significant and populous state of Uttar Pradesh. And as I was uh, uncovering, along with other reporters, mass graves of abandoned bodies that had simply been left by people too poor to be able to have a funeral, or you know, people abandoning their, their loved ones because COVID was so stigmatized and so invisibilized in the interiors of India. Intuitively, there should have been rage. Intuitively, there should have been anger. Now, I can understand that the immediate reaction was just survival, and maybe, therefore, that anger would not be immediate. But I've gone back many times since, and I don't sense any anger against the Modi government for its handling and some, some fatal mistakes that were made by the government in its handling of the COVID crisis. So you have to step back and ask yourself, why is that? Why are people so willing to forgive, overlook, look the other way from, or even move past mistakes that other politicians pay a much higher price for? Is it just that we as a people are culturally fatalistic? There is an element of that as well. There is an element of cultural fatalism in the Indian people when it comes to suffering especially among our poor. But that doesn't explain the whole story. If ever the Modi government should have been on the defensive, it was in the aftermath of COVID. And so you have to step back and ask yourself, how is it that a leader gets past all the mistakes that he makes? COVID handling had mistakes. Demonetization 
almost every person, including supporters of the Modi government, agree that it was a mistake. Uh, the farm legislation is something that uh, the prime minister had to roll back on. So it's not as if this government has never changed its mind or never rolled back on some of its policy decisions. And what we're hopefully going to do in this sort of dialogue that we're going to have this evening is to try and be dispassionate. That's the first important thing. Uh, if we're going to get caught up in where we stand ideologically on whether we like the BJP or we don't like the BJP, we like the prime minister, we don't like the prime minister, I don't think that's useful to us as students of politics. Uh, who want to understand what's happening, not just in our country, but across the world. What gives, you know, what leads to the rise and rise of leaders like Narendra Modi and others in the world is what we're here to understand. So I just wanted to frame that a little bit. My sense is that there are patterns globally that we can apply uh, to our understanding of India. The first thing is that everything in politics is about having a good story. Politics to a large extent is What's the message you take to people, right? What is the, when I come to you and I say, vote for me, why would you vote for me? You would either vote for me because I stand for something that you agree with, or because you think I'm going to change your life, or because in me, you see shades of your own life, or in me, you see the possibility of dreaming, or in me, you see some sort of tribalistic, you know, primitive primal instinct fulfilled. And I would argue that in Narendra Modi, there's a little bit of all of this taking place. Let's start with the first thing. There's a sense, and, I, and the immediate example or the immediate analogy that comes to mind, Maya, is Donald Trump. Trump, who was like this New York millionaire, managed to position himself as an anti-elite politician, as an outsider, right? Now, this narrative of the outsider the outsider trying to make it in a closed world of politics, it's a very powerful one for people, for the voter, because the voter at all times thinks of herself as an outsider. The voter never feels like an insider in a political system. So when you have a person who presents himself as the outsider, the struggling outsider to a system, it's something very relatable. And you don't actually sit there and deconstruct is this true? Is it accurate? Is this fake news? What is it? So you think of Trump playing the outsider to the sort of DC beltway cabal, and you think of Mr. Modi playing the outsider to the Khan market, Latians Delhi cabal, of which I have often been described as a member, right? Uh, and, and we were just saying before the talk that it's, of course, amplified and exaggerated, often distorted, but it's not without elements of truth. And you may have today, uh, an old establishment replaced by a new establishment, an old cabal replaced by a new cabal, um, so that you just have a new bunch of outsiders and a new bunch of insiders. But the fact is that that first message of anti-elitism, I, I actually find that common to the rise of many populist leaders globally. The second, uh, all of these leaders, if you see their rise, are rooted, their growth is rooted in a existing cynicism about mass media. Whether, and again, I would, I would say, if you look at what's happening in the United States of America, you have completely polarized consumers of news media, and you have this name calling of media that never used to take place before. And if the media doesn't confirm your political bias, then that media is biased. And as the media loses the power to be able to change the minds of people, Politicians and successful populist leaders are able to other the media, vilify it, and almost render it irrelevant. The skepticism and the cynicism of mass media has been accompanied by the explosion of digital media. And digital media, of course, makes it also possible for facts to not be as sacred as before. So this is the paradox of our times, that you actually uh, diss the mainstream media, the old media, for not having uh, integrity, for being biased. It's not always true, but that's the narrative you present. And at the same time, you're able to directly leverage a Twitter, a Facebook, an Instagram, WhatsApp. It's the, 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 the biggest vehicle of fake news in India is WhatsApp. Uh, and, and you're able to convey you know, whatever message you want to bypassing facts or what Trump famously called post-truth. So anti-elitism, the othering of the media, um, cult of personality. You know, we have a parliamentary system of government derived actually from the British, uh, but never before has it mattered to have a face, 
a face to a campaign. And we see this now, uh, this, this, this sort of presidential sort of dimension to parliamentary politics. Uh, ever since the, the, the sort of advent of Modi, uh, you, you see this playing out in the same way, even in state elections, even in regional elections. So you need a personality, you need the cult of personality. Nationalism. You know, you've done a lot of work on nationalism, Maya. Uh, I use the word loosely. I don't want to get us to get lost in a debate over whether nationalism is a European style nationalism or what do I mean by nationalism. I'm just using the word as common people use it every day. People who are not in academics, who are not historians, what do they understand by nationalism? They quite simply understand a sentimental attachment to their nation state, to what they feel when the anthem plays, to what they feel when they see their military veterans, what they feel, uh, you know, when, when, when they see their flag. Populist leaders, are, and in India, uh, I think this has been Modi's great success, much more than, let's say, in the United States of America, where I think there is no significant difference in the politics of nationalism between the Democrats and the Republicans. I would argue in India, I think the fatal uh, mistake uh, of, of the, the left, certainly, and, in, and sections of liberal politicians has been to not, uh, it has been to let the right wing co-opt the entire nationalist narrative and own it. Um, whereas, you know, uh, there is a kind of constitutional patriotism uh, that you could mainstream into your politics. But unfortunately, the, 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 there's a kind of liberal narrative that sees nationalism as uncool. Uh, but when you see it as uncool, you're missing the fact that the majority of your country doesn't see it as uncool and finds it relatable. Right. So nationalism and then, of course, Hindutva. Right. Um, I, I, uh, Vinay Sitapati, uh, a, a sort of fellow journalist, now almost historian, wrote a book on the BJP before Modi. And I was doing an interview with him and I, I said to him that I thought that, you know, the difference between Narendra Modi and Atul Bihari Bajpai, both of whom have been right wing leaders who have led, led India was that I used to think that India was such a complex and diverse country that anyone who governed it would move, uh, would be moved to the center, both from the left and the right, because it was that kind of country, but that the prime minister had possibly, and his party, had possibly succeeded in pivoting the country to the right, as opposed to the country pivoting him to the center. And I think you're seeing a very, very smart, trope of nationalism that actually subsumes Hindutva. So it doesn't even have to be overt when at the prime ministerial level, it doesn't have to be overt anymore. It doesn't have to be overtly articulated because it comes as a kind of layer, a subterranean layer that gets co-opted in the larger sort of nationalist narrative as the BJP plays it. And uh, the last point I would say, and then I just want this to be a dialogue. I'm sorry, I've taken a bit of time in this, in this answer, is welfareism. Modi is not a right-wing uh, leader at all on economics. He is not conservative fiscally. Uh, he is a left leader on economics. And I remember in 2019 when I was traveling then to, uh, through UP and a lot of people felt that the pri prime minister was going to receive, you know, there was going to be a setback, it was going to be a tough election. And I would just meet women who would tell me that they had voted for him because they had a gas cylinder or they had a toilet. And, you know, it, 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 I would go back and I would tell people and say, oh, you've just fallen for government propaganda uh, because these were some of their big schemes. And I said, well, you know, I, there's no question of my falling for propaganda. I have, uh, you know, criticized this government, sections of this government have criticized me. So it's not as if, you know, we're always on the same side of the trenches when it comes to politics. But I found that among India's poorest citizens, there was a, a kind of success with the microeconomic policy of Modi's essential welfareism and never actually giving up the role of the state. So while the prime minister may have said uh, that he wants to minimize government, actually the state and the institutions of government have never been as important and as connected to the lives of people for good or for bad. And we saw that in COVID, it can work the other way around also. So these are my own six reasons for why I think Mr. Modi keeps winning elections. Uh, the corollary to this is what the people challenging them have of these six points or don't have, but we can get into that later. Great. Yes, I have, I have also lots of questions, but let me turn it over to you and um, ask you if you have questions that you would like to pose. And for those of you who are joining us online, please don't forget to put your questions into the chat. Um, 
questions? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Soumya from India. I'm currently in uh, the MPP cohort here. Um, so I had two questions. One was, you mentioned the opposition very briefly, so I want to pivot yeah. towards that. Do you, I mean, I know like we don't have a crystal ball, but do you think an opposition coalition is likely for 2024? Um, you know, with the TMC, IMC, uh, NCP, everyone coming together. And do you think that they have enough of sway to pose a legitimate challenge in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, my second question, I, I really admire Mojo's story. Um, I think it's a it's, it's really um, amazing that you've started it and we do still have independent news outlets in India, the very few. Um, what is your view on, on sort of the institutional co-option of mainstream media at present? Um, I, I've also been a victim, I used to work for the Congress, so I've also been a victim of um, media attacks. Um, uh, so yeah, I wanted to know. What okay, I'd love to hear more about uh, how you were a victim, but uh, let me say to you, and I'm, I'm so, you know, I don't know if you like what I'm saying because you have worked with the Congress. I actually think the Congress is the weak link uh, in whether there will be a national front countering Mr. Modi in 2024. Uh, and I say this because I think within the Congress at the top levels of leadership, there is some belief, uh, a la Susan Sarandon, uh, when she said about Donald Trump, I'm not going to vote for anybody, let the whole system come crashing down. My understanding of Rahul Gandhi's way of thinking about politics is almost that let the Congress just come to bits before it can be built again, because he doesn't seem to believe in the way that it is structured presently. Now, I personally believe that this is a self-indulgence uh, that you you cannot you know you cannot hold on to the idea of perfect and let it become the uh, the enemy of good, which is what uh, there's some sort of utopian rebuilding of the Congress, obviously in the second generation Gandhi's imagination that I don't see any visible manifestation of taking place. I think there is deep denialism. Look at what's happening. Let's. I don't know how many of you. I, I, I want to keep this specific, but also keep it general enough for everybody to not miss my references. So Uttar Pradesh, which many of you would know to be this heartland Indian state where elections are being held, you have a fragmented opposition. Goa, which is a small state, just the opposite of UP, you have a fragmented opposition. No matter where you look, your anti-BJP parties are actually completely dividing the population. There is no one cohesive, hey, we all came together to take on this behemoth, this juggernaut called the BJP. So I just think that there is some sort of denialism. And I think the reason for that is that there is right now only one national party that, that is seen as the alternative, possible alternative, which is the Congress. And then everybody else are these sort of regional parties. And these regional parties are flirting with, with, with their, you know, their, their exploring relationships outside of their state with the electorate. And if one of them manages to build outside of their immediate region, then I think you will see them emerging as the invariable leader of that, that coalition. But as of now, uh, for example, Mamta Banerjee's experiment to do this in Goa I don't know, the results aren't out, but I don't think it succeeded. Arvind Kejriwal is going to have better luck in Punjab. And if he's able to take the Punjab from the Congress, I think you will see him emerge once again as a kind of national headline. But I'm not very, um, what, what's the word? I don't see this happening in the neat way uh, that a lot of people think it might. I, I just don't, I think there's just too much denialism and, and too much let's wait for our time to come. You know, in Hindi, they say, apna time aega. Congress at least seems to have decided that it time be Now, God knows what happens to the party, whether it even survives uh, till then. Um, you asked me an unconnected question on the media. It is a depressing time. It, it, it's actually a strange time. It's an um, exhilarating and depressing time to be a journalist, right? It's an exhilarating time because you realize that what, strangely, in these tough, horrible two years, because everything went virtual, Suddenly, uh, if you were a small independent outlet and you know you didn't have big satellite vans and you didn't have big dish, satellite dishes, but you told somebody, you know, it could be Indra Nui, who I just recently interviewed, hey, or you know, Hillary Clinton, I'm sending you a link. It was considered totally normal. I'm sending you an email link, please join. And you, you know, you weren't considered the small guys uh, to be able to not have the, that big, you know, the big sort of paraphernalia that comes with big media. Um, there is 
you know, I wouldn't be as upset about sections of, of mainstream media being co-opted by power as I am upset by the fact that sections of media have become hate mongers. Like, I think what bothers me the most is to see that even in the middle of a pandemic, you can have television channels using the hashtag Corona Jihad to target a religious minority in the middle of a pandemic. And these are not fringe channels. These are some of the most watched television stations. So for me to watch television become an instrument of hate uh, disturbs me way more than, oh, these are guys too scared to take on the government. There have always been guys in the media too scared to take on the government, but I have never seen television participate in this level of hate mongering as it does today in India. Let me pick up on one of those points that is also related to a question that I see online by Vinay Gopal, um, who's asking about the divided non-charismatic opposition. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, related to Saumya's point. So when you think, again, beyond India, yeah. it's striking that the one place where the nationalist populist has really been defeated in the United States, Donald Trump, is the place where there is a single united party opposing the nationalist populist. Whereas, for example, in Britain, um, the opposition is divided between three parties, um, arguably two, maybe three. Much is true, as you're saying, of mm. India and, and the regional parties. So is it, you know, how much, if you had to say, you know, you have these six factors, yeah. is it, but what are really the most important ones? Is it the lack of a unified opposition that is the most important or, you know, among the most important? Yeah, uh, I don't think it's just the lack of unity because that would make the counter to uh, the BJP under Narendra Modi arithmetic, whereas I think the counter, uh, you know, the answer lies in chemistry and not in math. Uh, and, 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 and quite simply what that means is that even if you aggregated all of these people and put them on one side and then said if you break down the numbers, you've got Modi versus the rest, uh, it, it, it could still come a cropper. And the reason for that is because, again, where's the leader? What's the message? What's your story? And what's your story that isn't being defined by Narendra Modi, right? So, for example, you've all decided that suddenly uh, Indian voters really care about whether you go to a temple, a mosque, or a church, or a gurdwara. Uh, you suddenly feel the need uh, to be much more visible with your religious practice. All of each opposition politician. Because... The BJP has succeeded in, in, in conveying uh, that the politics of the opposition is anti-Hindu and in many cases anti-India. And, and, and therefore, I believe that, yes, of course, the arithmetic matters. But what matters even more is that you do not have a person or a story that is different enough or, you know, similar enough. You either need somebody similar enough or you need somebody very different. You can't have a halfway house. You know, I'll give you an example from my own profession. All of you know of this guy called Ornab Goswami. I don't, I don't really like talking about him, but since like we're talking about things, let's, let's talk about him. Let's see what happened to him in television. So he's a populist right-wing television presenter, right? So it's also important to understand the rise of the right in mainstream media. And he touched a chord using many of these same formulas. He, he, he became a personification uh, of a certain kind of middle class anger against corruption. Uh, he, he, he became very, very strident. He was the face of the news. He was the face of the channel. It was all very singular, you know, all of that. What did, what did his competition do? His competition in television decided to become like a paler version of him, right? Now, when they sought to be a paler version of him, they basically failed because they were neither different enough nor were they. This is exactly what the opposition is doing with the BJP. They're all being paler versions of the BJP. You're not going to be paler versions of the BJP and be able to fight the BJP because why do I want the, the, why do I want the imitation when I can have the real thing, right? So the question is, what is your story and who are you? What are you telling me that's going to draw me in? And, you know, you mentioned, um, like, global examples and Biden. Look what's happening in the United States of America. Biden's non-charisma is catching up with him in governance. Um, and, and, and there are reports that Trump could run again. 
He probably will. We don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. Let's look closer home here in the United Kingdom. Um, Labour, maybe it's different now, but for a long time, Labour was taken to such a left of the spectrum that most people here, most voters here could not relate to it. And so you had this sort of Teflonist, I know it sounds odd to describe Boris Johnson as, 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 as Teflon at a time like this, where his parties and, and so on, you know, are, are, he's probably had his lowest ratings in years. But the fact is that here too, from what I understand, like the opposition to him, like the, you know, the, the Scottish Nationalist Party is probably more of a counter to him than Labour is. And that is exactly what's happening in India, that you have these regional parties that are able to effectively take on Modi, but they never have the cadre or the personality to take him on nationally. So it's not that Modi can't be defeated. Modi can be defeated. Modi has been defeated, but not at a national level. I think we had a question over here. Thank you so much, Ms. Das, for this opportunity. Um, I'm Aryan. I'm also from Delhi. And my question was about something you mentioned in the introduction about the Khan Market Gang, about this group of possibly undefined English-speaking elites in Delhi who have run the country since independence. I wanted to understand how prevalent a narrative, how important is Modi's anti-elitism in states like Uttar Pradesh, in the rest of India, outside of yeah. Delhi and Bombay? And I mean, like the person who asked the first question, I was briefly associated with the Congress. So I've seen the way the Congress party functions and I've seen how the Gandhi family have been portrayed as the Khan Market Gang. In fact, one definition of the Khan Market Gang could be the Gandhi family and their supporters. Yeah. So will the opposition be able to build a narrative if they are defined by the Gandhi family and by elitism that India's aspirational middle class just doesn't want anymore? So it's a great question. And I'll give you an example uh, from my own travels in, in, in Uttar Pradesh. And you know how in, 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 in the West, it's uh, very important for a politician to be seen to have a picture postcard family. So that sort of the idea of suburban bliss with the, 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 the spouse, the children, the I don't know, the Pomeranian and the picket fence, right? Uh, that's a, a compelling compelling idea, the family man or woman. Uh, with Narendra Modi, it has been so intriguing for me to see on the ground. People actually talk about, uh, I'll say it in Hindi and then I'll translate it. People will actually tell you, unka to koi nahi hai, wo to corrupt ho hi nahi sakte, kyunki unka to bachche hi nahi hai, which means that he can't possibly be corrupt because he has no children. Wo, what will he do? He's just in this for, you know, for us, the poorest person has this perception that this sort of idea of, of, of a single person in politics without any visible sort of family unit, without children, it actually works to his advantage in the perception of him as a full-time politician, juxtaposed with the perception of the Khan market gang as people who do politicians on politics on the side, but actually it doesn't take up their whole life. Now, you might say that's a good thing. The voter doesn't think so. The voter does not think that being a part-time politician and doing politics as one element of your life is a good thing, right? Uh, the voter is impressed by the sort of rapacious appetite that no election is too small to give everything that you've got to win. I believe that the opposition missed a, a chance in this pandemic. I think that in these two years, if you had seen people, and there were some, and there were some even in the Congress, there was B.B. Srinivas, uh, a youth Congress leader, whom BJP leaders and BJP voters were is sending SOS messages to, can you please arrange an oxygen cylinder for us? When the systems of the state collapsed and people had just each other to turn to, there were some politicians, and I, I've named one who was an opposition leader who emerged as somebody who did try and have a mass connect. But a lot of other opposition leaders just hunkered down. They stayed at home. They acted as sort of, you know, people who were protecting themselves, right, in a moment of national crisis instead of 
going out there. And they wait, there were ways of going out there because some of us did go out there. Therefore, there were ways of going out there, right? And, and they didn't do that. They weren't with their constituents in the sort of biggest recent crisis or public health emergency that, that I can remember. And, and so you're right in saying that the, this, this swipe about being Khan market politicians, for anyone of you who doesn't know what Khan market is, it's just a posh little neighborhood in Delhi uh, where there's just some good restaurants to hang out in. So it's just like a posh part of, of, of the city, but it's become interchangeably used for elitism. Uh, you're right in saying that it's just a sort of, in some ways, a social media cliche, but then I'd again say, so what's the counter? What's the counter? What is the opposition saying to tell their own story? And I think that's where these little cliches, they just start adding up. You know, so you've got to present yourself as being politicians of the people. And I don't think that has to do with dynasty, by the way. Before that comes up, I, I should just take that head on. Yes, Modi's story as the, 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 the son of a tea vendor is a compelling story, but there are lots of regional politicians who've done very well, even though they're the children of politicians, just because they seem to be full-time politicians. So I think the perception of being a full-time politician is really important. Great. Um, I'm going to go to one online, and then I'll come, come back to the room. So. There is a question from Sandra Hausner about the extent to which Modi's success is his own mm -hmm. or is attributable to the BJP or, or the RSS. Um, and it says, you know, she asks, the BJP has been steadily gaining ground, say, since the 70s. And would any leader have stepped, who stepped into the fray, gained prominence? And I, I'm going to tack on a question to that about what the BJP looks like beyond Modi, mm. right? So, so it's hard to imagine now, yeah. but there will come a time when Modi is no longer in power. And um, what, what happens then? Does, is Modi able to take, because this is related to the question of how much of it, this is about Modi mm -hmm. and Modi's charisma and his, his chemistry, as you said, right? Or how much is it about um, him being at the right place at the right time where the kind of the, the RSS came out in large numbers? And that is a question also about whether in turn in 10 years and 20 years, uh, people like Amit Shah um, can, can become Modi's successor. Mm. I mean, it's a very interesting uh, question and there's no easy answer, but let me attempt one. I do believe that people vote today for Modi and not for the BJP. Uh, and, and, and that is borne out by the fact that in many elections, you'll see local legislators being quite unpopular and they do get voted out. But when it comes to the big national vote, you'll still see them leaning towards Modi. But I also believe that Modi without the BJP cadre, without the RSS cadre, would not find it easy. So you need both. You need the person and you need the cadre. And uh, in, in the Congress's case, they still are the only party with national presence. So they have somewhat of a cadre, though it's getting wiped out in state after state, but they have somewhat of a pan-India cadre, but they don't have the person. The BJP benefits right now because it has both the person and the cadre. Right. Uh, you take a newbie, relative newbie like an Arvind Kejriwal, who has a, it, a compelling personal story, or at least as politics goes, he has a good story. It's again the self-made middle class IIT boy, you know, who started off by fighting corruption, then mainstreamed himself, but he doesn't have the card. So you need both. And, and one of the reasons that the Congress flounders is because it's losing its card. And it doesn't have that person at the top to lead that story. Uh, the RSS enables the rise of Modi, but I do not believe that if you put another person instead of Mr. Modi, I don't, right now, I don't believe that the results will be the same. Okay. Thank you so much for coming here. I'm also from India, from the hilly state of Uttarakhand. Oh. Uh, I, I actually want to build up on the last point that you just made, where we're talking about BJP and RSS as cadre. BJP, which has typically been a cadre-based organization, is currently being run by Mr. Modi, who's a populist leader. Um, in the previously, it has been understood that RSS influences BJP-led governments 
both at the state and the center. Now with Mr. Modi as a prime minister, there has been a, a centralization of power, which is kind of at odds with how typically, typically the Carter-based organizations like BJP and RSS run. So I just want to understand with this in mind, do you think this relationship will continue to be symbiotic or would you see more fragmentations within the BJP and RSS? Like you just talked about how yeah. they are working. I on mean, I think the RSS would have loved a, a weakened Modi, which would have kept them as the organization affiliated to power, uh, but yet, yet a leader that they could steer. Uh, I don't think that has happened. Uh, I think that the control very much rests as you said, the power has been centralized. And if you shut your eyes and you think of which other leader this reminds you of, uh, I would say it reminds us of Indira Gandhi, right? This sort of centralization of, of, of power, the appropriation of power uh, in, in, in a very sort of close coterie around yourself and uh, an individual personifying power. The last leader I can remember, uh, and I was, you know, I wasn't very sort of, I wasn't a journalist in her time, but at least from everything that I study and, and read about, it seems to me that Indira Gandhi is the closest parallel that we have, not ideologically identical, uh, but nationalist, populist, tough, tough matters. Suddenly we have gone from the sort of non-tough Dr. Manmohan Singh. So, you know, maybe we need to spend a little bit more time understanding that also the psychological need for people to look towards somebody to say, hey, this person will solve, will make my life better. This person must have the answers because I don't, you know. Uh, but yes, to answer your, your question, I think the RSS would have preferred, uh, you know, I think Walter Anderson has this book on the RSS where he actually talks about this, that it's not that the RSS at all stages loved Narendra Modi um, and were uncomfortable certainly with this sort of very personalized, uh, person-centric politics, because actually that goes against how any Carter-based organization, whether the communists or the right-wing thinks. Um, but this is the reality that they're confronted with. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, it brings us back to the point that you started off with, which was about, you, I think your sixth point was about the, the, your six point formula yeah. for Modi's success was, you know, welfareism. And yes. when you think about the comparison between Modi today and Indira Gandhi, you know, there is a there is a similarity to the personal uh, brand of delivering toilets and gas yes. cylinders and such like, and Indira Gandhi's Garibi Hatao, and the way in which it was very much about development. The interesting thing is that. Um, you know, Modi did a campaign in 2014 mm -hmm. on development, 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 and on development, which is as distinct from welfareism, he hasn't really delivered, right? I mean, where is, where is development or job creation on mm -hmm. the agenda? That's not talked about anymore. It's welfareism, right, as distinct from, from development. It's welfareism, and it's also that this is a, a government that really does know how to change the headline. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, why is there such little talk, for example, about jobs or what's happened? You know, what how is India going to emerge from the economic debris of of COVID? Uh, you know, I think more than 85 percent of Indians surveyed by Oxfam said that they had they were earning less today than they earned two years ago, more than 85 percent. Right. Uh, when you when you think about that, 230 million Indians were pushed into poverty in the first year of the pandemic. Right. Now, these are staggering numbers. Why are they not electoral issues? Why are they not issues on which people vote? There are some answers for it. One, either people believe that, you know, the government did the best it could. It was a global crisis. Look, even America is struggling. They can't even vaccinate half their population. Right? Uh, or people get distracted by something else they believe in. So it's, I mean, I don't know if it's an apt analogy, but if we think of personal relationships in our lives, right? There may be things we don't like about people in our lives, but we say, okay, you know what? He or she is not good at this, but you know what? At least I have this. And I think the Modi government is, uh, and, and, and the Modi campaign manages more than the government, uh, because this is not about governance, it's about campaigning, and it's a government perennially in campaign mode, uh, is very deft 
at convincing people about the other stuff, right? So whether it's Hindutva, whether it's perennially uh, having an imaginary or real opponent. If you, if you, if you notice, the BJP does very well uh, in, in an antagonist mode. So, you know, we're taking on the elites, we're taking on Pakistan, we're taking on pseudo-secularists, we're taking on uh, this sort of fake history, you know, we brought, we, we corrected history. There's always, we, we, we took on this Latians gang, we took on um, th this, this mass media that was, you know, sort of fattened of, uh, by the old elites, etc. I mean, I'm just giving you their narrative to say that they're very, very, uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's 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 psyops. They're very very good at being able to create a sense of the other that they then step in and are the saviors, you know, of that situation. So what happens is that the that a lot of the headlines that don't suit them either they change the headline or and this has to be recognized about Narendra Modi, he does not hesitate to change his mind when he wants to. And the taking back of the farm legislation, which for a year, uh, every BJP supporter said, these are, you know, Khalistanis, these are anti-nationals, whatever. This is, oh, they'll, we're not going to do anything. And then just on the eve of the election, he he took them back. And and I, I, I see, you know, I used to say when, when he became prime minister in the first term and he suddenly landed up in Pakistan uh, to see if he could make peace with Nawaz Sharif, who was still then prime minister. I used to say that, you know, his opponents underestimate the fact that Modi is not always driven by ideology. That is the, that is the, it's, it's a very limited way of understanding him. I think he's driven by his sense of his legacy. That is what defines him much more than um, being wedded in the way that the RSS may have been to some ideological notion. So it, you will suddenly, I mean, I think Prashant Kishore, uh, who used to work with him and is now a strategist for uh, some national front, if it happens, opposition front, said to me in a recent interview that I, I said, what's Modi's greatest strength, according to you? And he said, it's his ability to change himself, depending on the situation. And I don't think people have looked at him like that. People have looked at him in this very classic, static way that he's this ideologue, he's a right-wing Hindu nationalist populist. Okay, he's all of these things. That doesn't explain this ascent. So we have to go deeper to try and understand what's at play. So generating a sense of threat, but also this chameleon-like quality of, 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 of reinventing to the moment. Well, I mean, you could say chameleon, you could say, you know, a, a sense of the pulse of people going with what he thinks the people want at that point, which is populism, right? Uh, but again, it comes back to where's the story from the other side? Why has the opposition not been able to, right, talk about uh, jobs? How does the opposition get distracted by identity issues in every election? Because the moment it comes to an identity issue oriented political debate, the BJP wins that debate. That, that is how it happens. So I see a lot of hands and yes. we have and we have sort of 10 minutes left. So let me let me gather a few questions. Yes, and I think Professor Shahid Jameel, who's an old friend from India, oh, here as well, and hand going up. Start with you and then we'll gather a few. So uh, based on your previous two answers, uh, you said that a lot of economic distress and yet he remains, Mr. Modi remains popular. I mean, in India, historically, elections have never been won on economy. They've always been won on emotion. Yes. And so you are you know, sort of confirming that, that he, he appeals to people's emotions very well. Is there a chance that Mr. Modi will become bigger than the RSS? Or is, has that reached a stable equilibrium? equilibrium? Let me, let me gather, okay. let me gather gentlemen here. Uh, I'll try to be as quick as possible. I just, I don't know if that that has become a niche issue, but I just reading my friend Abhishek Saha's book, No Land's People. Hi. And uh, I'm the only 
guy in here who's not an expert in it. Yeah, okay, but uh, the only thing I had read about it before was was that the, uh, there was this long New York Times magazine story about it. And uh, yeah, and after finishing it, my my brain kind of explodes. Yeah, like how is how is this possible to win to render like millions of people stateless? And apart from Abhishek, obviously doing a great job, there was one thing that really bothered me uh, when we talked about when we had a debate about it afterwards. And I realized because you brought it up as well, like isn't there a lack of passion? to fight the Modi government. Yes, because true. I've been living in the US for the last 12 years and my personal thesis is that the reason why Trump got defeated in the end was because there was a passion mm -hmm. among people to take down this guy, whatever it takes, because people became highly aware at several points that this is shaking up the foundations of the republic. Thank take you. one more because I have another this gentleman over here. Uh, I my question is uh, more related to the the decay of democratic institutions and how to what extent can the success of uh, the BJP and Mr. Modi as well uh, by extension can be attributed to that decay? For example, the election commission, the Supreme Court, the CAG, and will they ever be able to come out of? the state that they find themselves in and can that be a reason of unwinding of the power as was the case with Indira Gandhi for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So so great question. Question. Yeah, I'll answer them quickly so we can get some more in. Professor Jamil, I do think he's already bigger than the RSS but I do not think that he would remain at the top of his game without the RSS. So there is symbiosis, but it's very clear who's in charge or who wields the power. That doesn't mean that tomorrow, if the RSS for some reason decided to withdraw all of its cadres from the BJP election process and Mr. Modi is an individual, just the very name, uh, he could keep winning. I, I, I think I said this earlier that the person without the cadre, I don't think could win, but the people do vote for the person and not for the cadre. That, that is my own impression. You said there is an absence of passion. Then you also said that people really wanted Trump out. People wanted Trump out. They, it, it is not clear that the people of India want anything different. Now, people means many things in a parliamentary system. We have a complicated system and people who don't like Mr. Modi will, will always turn around and say, oh, it was only 30% of India that voted for him and so on. I think that's a disingenuous argument because you can't embrace parliamentary systems and first pass the post when it suits you and dismiss them when it doesn't suit you. This is the system we have, perfect, imperfect. This is our demo democracy. Within that, people, as it's represented by a parliamentary process, don't seem to, uh, uh, to, 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 to be hungry for change. But I think that that's also related to the absence of passion in the opposition. The absence of passion is in the opposition. Where is the passion? You could count a handful of people and where they have been passionate, where there have been passionate contenders taking on the BJP at the state level. The BJP has often lost, but the absence of passion is in national opposition politics. It just, I don't see it. To your question, um, I think as a journalist, let me speak about the space I know. I think it's true that the media in India is not as institutionally free as it is, let's say, the United States, where the First Amendment really validates it, uh, you know, in a, in a way that we just don't have that historicity of, of, of a media where free speech will be protected at all costs. So, of course, that is an element. But, you know, I think we're being dishonest as students of politics if we hang on to those to explain what's happening. Because if you go out and just talk to people without the filter of, you need to publish this somewhere or you know you you without all of these institutions that you named you will find a, a a leader who till this moment continues to enjoy at least in the north of india there's a geographical divide here also which we haven't got into um, but in the north of india uh, massive popularity and 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 you know you i i think it's a Frankly, there are many problems with a lo lot of institutions, sure. Um, and I can only speak to the one I know, which I've already said has is you know is plagued by grave grave problems right now. But I don't think that that explains it. I think in a in, I think there are elections that have been genuinely fought and lost by the BJP. 
So these theories then get upended because if all of these institutions were so compromised, why would the BJP lose any election? So I don't buy this. I don't buy this. I think in fairness, you know, where there has been a smart campaign, where there has been an alternative, where there has been a strong contender, the BJP has sometimes lost. All right, we have time for one more round of questions. So um, this lady here. Um, just a forward-looking question. What can my role as a citizen here, like I sometimes feel so helpless that yeah. I want to do something and I just don't know where, like this incredibly powerful, popular person, what can be my role as a citizen to at least like challenge that narrative or oppose that narrative? Um, so maybe a naive question, but... Uh, let's start with, again, uh, something that I find people crib about media, my profession, all the time. But when you actually ask them, do you watch the media you hate? They'll all say yes. <laughs> right? Now, what does that do? It actually keeps those hate mongers in play. It gets them those eyeballs, it gets them those numbers, even if you watch out of morbid fascination or you watch because you don't want to be in the equity. I just find that there's so much consumption of content that we loathe as news becomes entertainment. Like you're almost sort of turning to it as, you know, like what rubbish, let's see, let's let's see the denominator or the depths that it's plummeted to today. I, I, I understand that there's a kind of baseness in how we consume journalistic content now, and it saddens me terribly as a journalist to sit here and say that. But I think that if you really care, like, for example, there's a question, there's the media compromise. If you think the media is compromised, please stop endorsing the media that you don't respect. You know, you can't be worthy about or want the media to be worthy and then not watch the media that you actually respect because actually you're just bored or your attention span is shrunk or, you know, you can't get past one paragraph or you can't watch a full interview or, or whatever. And you actually like that sort of, you know, dysfunctional television prime time. So you want a small thing you can do? Start by supporting voices in the media who are trying to create spaces of independence in a very, very difficult time, both economically because people hesitate to come and fund, uh, you know, ventures that are independent, uh, respect people who run subscription-driven models because they are bypassing big business houses and big political parties. Even our biggest newspapers are dependent today on government advertising to survive. In that equation itself is a compromise built in. So if you want a more truthful, truth-telling media, please start paying for the media that some, you know, it, it'll cost you less than a cup of Starbucks coffee per month. You know, what you spend on Starbucks a week, if you spend that on media a month, you would be making a difference. There a, was a very interesting uh, piece of uh, a recent study that came out comparing polarization in the US to the UK. And one of the things that it cited was that the, in the UK, 100% of British citizens use the BBC every month. 100%. Really? And when you compare that to the way that media works in the United States, that's just those figures alone um, create very different perspectives on the role that media can play in creating a center of And gravity. since you brought up this example of the BBC, we were talking before this talk about your paper on Boris Johnson. And I'd be quite intrigued to see the you know, what, like he's also somebody who seems to survive every crisis, just when everybody writes him off, yeah. he yeah. survives. Yeah. And I know you're doing some work in that yeah. space. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, so, yes, yeah. parallels. I, I mean, I do. I think I think that the role of the media is so different in the UK that it yeah. gives me a little bit of more hope that mm -hmm. polarization won't quite take the same form in the UK. One of the things that I'm running on is, 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 is uh, Keir Starmer, so the Labour opposition's recent uh, move towards patriotism. So he's sort of engaging this idea of what does it mean for uh, the opposition to be loyal? And so that's really a question that I think is very relevant to Modi's India as well, right? Very much so. So, so I, you brought up this idea of anti-national. Yeah. So how do you oppose the government right now and not be accused of being anti-national? How, how is it possible to be both critical and loyal at the same time? And that's a really, I think, fundamental question to democracies today. So, you know, I'll tell you, when I talk about pluralism in India, uh, the institution that I quote is the Indian Army. 
just to give you an example, uh, and I always talk about uh, the fact that most army units in India have what are called Sardharm Sthals, which are multi-religious uh, places of worship. Uh, you have commanding officers of uh, military units that during a festival take on the religion of their men and now increasingly women, uh, but for a long time men, uh, you know, we have sort of men at the front lines. But the fact that, and you have something called an MMG, which is a Mandir Masjid Gurdwara concept. Now, I think that if you make your language of secularism from an institution that even today, poll after poll will tell you is the most respected institution in India, an institution in which people have not lost faith. And you are able to create a language of pluralism from that institution, that institution that nobody would dare to call anti-national. Mm -hmm. Then I think that that story of secularism or pluralism has a different merit than if you're going to show me 10 photos of every opposition politician going to a place of worship and getting photographed. Right. So I just think that it's very interesting here that labor is has this sort of has embraced this idea of I'm a patriot because I just think we don't hear enough of uh, mainstreaming of the idea of what it means to be Indian. We have too many. Uh, you know, I, I, I get, by the way, I'm an equal opportunity offender and I get trolled by the right wing all the time, but I often get um, criticized by the left and the left finds me far too uh, sort of oriented towards the nation state. I, I am an Indian and I'm an extremely proud Indian. And, um, and, that is a pro and that is sometimes objected to. It's considered too militaristic. It's considered uh, too, 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 what, what's the word, status quoist. I actually think that you need to embrace these institutions because it is in these institutions that the majority of your country finds identification. So if you're going to walk away from these institutions because of some airy-fairy notion of some borderless world, then at least forget about winning elections. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we have more hands, but unfortunately we've run out of time. And so I would just ask you, to join me in thanking Barbara. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.